uh, to do that justice. So again, my topic today will be aging and the interplay of motivation and cognition. And just to give you a little bit of my personal history, uh, I came from a, a kind of traditional cognitive experimental lab at the University of North Carolina. I was very well versed and uh, trained in experimental methods um, and uh, became interested in cognitive aging during my doctoral work. And then only uh, later, as a postdoc and subsequently at Ryerson, um, have started to become interested more in, in the realm of motivation, emotion, and affect, and how it might modulate uh, some of the uh, age-related cognitive changes that are uh, very well documented by now. Uh, so it's sort of been a recent discovery for me, but actually I think I'm part of a, a larger trend there. I'm, I'm uh, uh, in a sense, uh, quite representative of, of cognitive aging researchers who have had this renaissance um, in the past decade or so of, of uh, returning perhaps to this, to this issue of motivation and, and affect and its role in cognition. So this is an overview of what I'll try to cover today. Uh, when I talk about motivation, cognition, and interactions, it makes sense to first spend a little bit of time introducing some of the basic findings in those two large areas, which are obviously uh, very big, and each of them would fill many, many lunch hour talks. Uh, so I'll do my best to kind of provide a little sketch of each. Uh, and then I'll spend the rest of the talk um, outlining some of the recent empirical findings, and some of these are from my own lab, so it's a very biased and selective review, um, findings about these interactions in younger and older adults. And if there's time at the end, I'd love to talk about uh, implications for successful aging, uh, implications uh, for scientific practice, but also for community-based uh, interventions and so on. And please, if you have questions or comments, feel free to, uh, to interrupt me at any point during the talk. Any talk about uh, cognitive aging uh, is, uh, has a good chance of starting out with a reference to the late Paul Baltus, who, uh, as you may know, was one of the giants of the lifespan movement. Um, and he really led that movement for, for many years. Uh, one of his uh, major contributions is this dual process model of lifespan intellectual development, whereby um, he and his colleagues distinguish between two large clusters of intellectual ability, one that he referred to as cognitive pragmatics. Uh, as it says here on the slide, uh, this uh, is sort of the, um, uh, the kinds of cognitive abilities that you build up uh, through cultural tradition, but also through personal experience. Things like language, writing and reading, um, uh, knowledge about how the world works, uh, general knowledge, but also wisdom about how social, uh, sort of the, the, the rules uh, that's written between the lines um, in social interaction. Uh, and the cognitive pragmatics are thought of as something that remains relatively stable with age, and if uh, it may even show some some improvements um, during the adult life course. On the other hand, cognitive mechanics uh, describe that other cluster of sort of more basic information processing abilities that are strongly dependent on the integrity of essentially the uh, central nervous system and that do show uh, some pronounced decline over the adult uh, years. So what are some of these cognitive uh, mechanics that Baitis and his colleagues were talking about? Well, the first and, and most basic of all, possibly, is the speed of processing. Uh, what do I mean by speed of processing? Well, we think of individuals uh, as being characterized by a certain speed. So if you, if you think that someone is uh, he's a really quick thinker, someone else is maybe a less quick thinker, you may be onto something. This is a, this is a notion that is ingrained in cognitive psychological thought as well. Uh, one way that you could test a person's uh, processing speed would be to administer something like the digit symbol substitution test, which is part of the uh, Wexler intelligence scale. So here, uh, individuals are asked to fill in these little blanks in this lower part of the table um, according to a coding scheme that is provided at the top. And the assumption is that the faster and more accurately that you can do this, uh, the greater your processing speed, so that this might be a relatively processed pure measure of speed. 
not entirely process pure, that it probably also captures a bunch of other things, uh, but speed definitely plays a role. Now, if you administer many of these types of speed tasks, and then you look at the commonalities across those different tasks, uh, essentially at the covariance uh, between among those tasks, and then you track that th those covariance as a function of uh, adult age, you see this unfortunate uh, linear decline in speed. And uh, this is a classic finding. It's been replicated many, many times, uh, and has led Salthouse and Madden to say that age differences in speed are among the largest of any behavioral uh, variables. What about more kind of interesting cognitive ab abilities? Speed is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to be quick, but what about uh, some other aspects of cognition? Uh, well, one step up the hierarchy of complexity is uh, attention and executive processing. So this is basically cognitive control, attentional control that keeps you on track, keeps you uh, focusing on um, relevant information, focusing away from irrelevant information. One way that psychologists have looked at uh, attention and, and at selective attention in particular is uh, with this visual search paradigm where you're looking for the one thing that pops out uh, or that is different among a sea of a heterogeneous uh, distractor items. So in this case, that would of course be the black upright T. Uh, in a case like this, it's very easy to do. It literally pops out uh, of the display. Uh, it doesn't take much time at all, and younger and older adults perform this equally well. But when the search becomes more difficult, more challenging, because more of the features are shared by the target item and the various distractor items that surround it, then it takes longer to detect that target or to realize that actually this display doesn't contain the target at all. So search becomes inefficient, uh, slow and onerous, and unfortunately it's been found in research with younger and older adults that this, uh, this cost, uh, these costs that we see in uh, inefficient search are that much greater in older adults. Uh, so there is a disproportionate slowing um, in, in older adults when they're performing these inefficient searches. What about uh, another aspect of attention, which is divided attention? Um, it's one thing to selectively focus on something that you're looking for. It's quite another to divide your attention between multiple ongoing activities. And it's something we do or we try to do uh, every day, all the time. Uh, we know that it's difficult. And that intuition was uh, borne out in this classic study by McDowd and uh, our own Fergus Craig. Uh, back in 1988, they gave their participants two tasks, one auditory, one visual. And uh, in one condition, the task, both tasks were uh, performed uh, separately uh, in isolation. In another, the so-called dual task condition, these tasks had to be performed concurrently. As you can imagine, not an easy thing to do. Uh, Plus, what was varied was the difficulty of each task. So the auditory and the visual task could be either easy or relatively more difficult. And as the difficulty increases, so here there's one hard task. Um, finally, in the last uh, graph over there, both are difficult. You can see that the reaction times that are plotted on the y-axis there, they, uh, they just go up through the roof. And that slowing as a function of the dual task demand, as a function of the difficulty of the individual tasks, that slowing is exacerbated in, again, the older adults. So uh, again, a very quotable uh, sentence here, observation by Fergus Craig, one of the clearest results in the experimental psychology of aging is the finding that older subjects are more penalized when they must divide their attention. All right, so much for uh, some of the bad news. Uh, unfortunately, I have a little bit more bad news, uh, and that concerns memory. Uh, and we know that there are different, many different kinds of memory, and I'm sure that, that, that this has been uh, the subject of previous presentations in this uh, forum. Uh, episodic memory refers quickly refers to memory for past events and episodes. For example, what did you have for lunch yesterday? Can you remember? Uh, semantic memory is um, Memory for general knowledge facts, such as what is the capital of France. Um, priming, sorry, priming is, uh, skipped one, is a little bit more subtle. This is not uh, an explicit form of memory, but rather is memory that is demonstrated um, uh, indirectly through behavior 
uh, after you've been familiarized with the stimulus through repeated exposure, you may be that much more fluent and effective at processing and thinking about that stimulus later on without even realizing that there was learning and memory involved. And that's referred to as priming. And finally, we have short-term memory, which of course is the ability to hold limited amounts of information in your current awareness for limited uh, periods of time, on the order of 30 to 60 seconds. Um, that's the phone number right there. Uh, so as you can see in these graphs, uh, these again are from a longitudinal study, very uh, high quality uh, study uh, done in Sweden, the Betula project. As you can see, unfortunately, there is this rather dramatic decline um, in episodic memory performance, whereas all the other forms of memory here show, um, don't really show that decline so clearly. They show uh, kind of a picture of relative stability with age. But clearly, episodic memory, the ability to remember specific events and episodes in their temporal and spatial context uh, is uh, impaired as people get older. What are the neurobiological mechanisms of all this change? Um, of course, again, this could fill many, many uh, uh, lunch hour talks. Uh, so just a quick review. For one, there is age-related decline in brain volume, also as some people like to call it uh, brain shrinkage. It's not a nice word, but it does des <laughs> describe the reality. Uh, here you can see two MRI uh, sections of a younger and an older individual's mm -hmm. brains. These are healthy individuals. And of course, they have slightly different anatomy. They're different people. But what you can sort of appreciate is that uh, the ventricular space, those little holes in the middle of the brain, um, those are enlarged in this older adult. And that is a very typical finding. So um, it's fluid filled. And uh, so there is a widening of those ventricles. There is also a widening and deepening of the cortical sulci, those grooves in the cortical surface. Um, and that, again, is typical. And it's not um, uniform across the brain, but rather is particularly seen, this atrophy is seen in the prefrontal cort uh, cortex, which is uh, helps with executive function and attentional control, uh, as well as in uh, the medial temporal lobes, and particularly the hippocampus, which, of course, is important for memory. But it's not just the gray matter uh, that, that tends to shrink as we get older. There, is also, um, there are also normative changes in the integrity of white matter. So white matter contains those uh, nerve bundles that connect disparate parts of the brain with one another so that they can work together and, and talk to one another um, and support cognition. And there is uh, various methods have shown now with uh, uh, neuroimaging that there is disconnection uh, in that white matter. Uh, and what we can see here in this picture, I don't know how well it, it shows up, are these little white dots um, in the white matter. Uh, and they're called white matter hyperintensities. And they, those become much more common as we age also. And this is not a necessarily a sign of a pathological change. It's, it appears to be, to some extent, normative. Uh, there's also a deficient neuromodulation, uh, mostly a decline in the presence or in the effectiveness with which uh, these neurotransmitters are used uh, of acetylcholine, dopamine, and serotonin, and all of these are important for cognition. So going back to Paul Baltus, he said, uh, the process of development is not a simple movement toward higher efficacy, such as incremental growth. Rather, throughout life, development always consists of the joint occurrence of gain, growth, uh, and loss, decline. And that is a very nice uh, observation. It's a, uh, it's a hopeful statement. And it's sometimes expressed uh, visually as this sort of shifting balance of gains and losses. Note that there are still gains in old age. Uh, the balance may shift, but there are still, uh, according to this lifespan view, there are still supposed to be gains in old age. So the question then uh, is, where are those gains? If, as I've been reviewing, there are all these bad things that happen to the brain, to cognition, slowing, what are the gains? And that, of course, leads us straight into this uh, second aspect, socio-emotional aging. Uh, here the story is going to be far more uh, encouraging. What is psychological research found regarding well-being, emotion, and motivation in advanced age? Well, what if you simply ask people how they're feeling? 
uh, or perhaps um, more specifically, you ask them about particular aspects of subjective well-being that have been um, that are thought of as theoretically uh, significant. Some of these aspects are positive relations with other uh, people, autonomy, independence, environmental mastery, the degree to which you feel like you're uh, sort of a master of your own environment, you're, uh, you're able to navigate your environment successfully, uh, having a purpose in life, and uh, having a sense of personal growth, of continued uh, growth. Um, as you can see, some of these aspects seem to uh, seem to dip a bit, uh, and in particular purpose in life and personal growth, perhaps not surprisingly, show these declines in old age. Um, whether that has to be so is a question, uh, but in this study that is what was found. Um, in contrast, though, some of these other aspects, positive relations, autonomy, and environmental mastery show clear positive trends with age, which is a very encouraging finding. So this is self-report. What about aff affective experience? Still uh, sticking to the self-report measures, um, Laura Karstensen and her colleagues have done some really interesting work on uh, emotional experience in aging. And they, uh, in this 2000 study, they used uh, an interesting technique. They gave uh, their participants who were adults uh, young adults, middle-aged, and older adults, they gave them pagers, and then they sampled, uh, they paged them at, at unpredictable times of day, uh, an unpredictable number of times of day, and whenever they were, whenever these individual were, individuals were paged, they were asked to write down their current affective state. How were they feeling at that point in time, and what were they um, preoccupied with? And what was found in this very large and ambitious study was that the frequency of negative affect dramatically declined in um, middle adulthood and kind of stayed really low uh, in older age. Uh, I'm not showing uh, the graph for positive affect, but it's essentially the inverse. So positive affect uh, becomes more likely in old age. An interesting point that I personally think is really fascinating is uh, shown in the second graph. As you can see, there's an increase in their measure they call differentiation of emotional experience. And what that refers to is kind of the ability to have more than one emotion at the same time. It's kind of like the complexity or poignancy of emotional experience grows, sort of like uh, you know, a good wine uh, becomes more complex and richer as, you, uh, as it gets older, uh, kind of a similar phenomenon. There also seems to be relative stability in the intensity of emotional experience, as well as in the way that it's expressed through uh, facial expressions and gesture. Um, so there isn't really that kind of um, merciless decline that we saw <coughs> earlier in the cognitive um, aging slides. Here, there it seems to be more a picture of improvement or, uh, at the very least, maintenance, stability. Um, personality, well, until, uh, I'd say, the 90s, uh, the vast majority of personality researchers in psychology uh, held on to a view whereby personality doesn't really change. Once you hit 30, um, you're, uh, you know, it's done. Your, your personality is set. You are conservative. You're an extrovert. You're, you're, uh, you, know, you have these various traits, and they will not change. Um, and not so surprisingly, perhaps, that view is not uh, has not really been supported in more recent research. So there is actually personality change uh, in middle age and old age. Um, one aspect that changes is emotional stability. This is sort of the inverse of neuroticism, which is a more uh, perhaps better known term. Uh, one of the major personality dimensions that have been um, that have been proposed by personality researchers. So there's an increase in emotional stability decrease in neuroticism. Uh, there's also an increase in an aspect, uh, a facet of extroversion, which is called uh, social dominance. <laughs> so I don't know if any of the here present have uh, experienced this, but assertiveness um, increases as you get older, according to these data. Th these are meta-analytic data, by the way. So we can place some trust in them. They, they synthesize results from many studies. What's the, the last one there? Uh, the bottom one? Uh -huh. That is social vitality, which is another aspect of uh, extroversion. 
um, essentially the number of social uh, contacts and the, you know, the degree to which you're socially active, uh, and we do see a bit of decline there. Um, so it's not, there is, the message is there is no stability in the sense that nothing changes when you get older. On the contrary, there are these big mean level changes whereby entire cohorts become less, uh, show less neuroticism, more social dominance, also more um, conscientiousness and agreeableness. Mm -hmm. So uh, very much in contrast to the stereotype of the elderly curmudgeon. Um, here we have some, uh, just a little sample. This is, these are uh, background data from a sample uh, that we used in a study that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, so just uh, Torontonians uh, that we didn't exactly grab off the street, but community dwelling, younger and older adults. And I wanted to present this uh, just because it so nicely shows uh, some of these uh, age-related changes in personality and mood. So you can see that in our small sample already we have a significant difference in neuroticism, whereby the older adults are less have less neuroticism than the younger adults. And we also see a significant increase in positive mood and a decrease in negative mood. Of course, these are all self-reported um, variables. Uh, Brent Roberts at the University of Illinois um, sort of proposed one possible explanation for this personality change in adulthood. Uh, he said, making normative commitments to the conventional social institutions necessary to create an identity gives rise to the increases in traits associated with psychological maturity, such as agreeableness, conscientiousness, and emotional stability. So this is the idea that because we um, would really come to fill these roles uh, of uh, husband, uh, wife, uh, um, you know, we have professional identities and so forth, uh, all of these roles, we grow into them and they foster uh, <coughs> growth in turn in psychological maturity. Uh, so an adaptive process, really. A, a different aspect of adaptation um, has been proposed as an explanation of personality change in adulthood by Laura Carstensen. Um, she places a greater emphasis on really motivational changes, on, on changes in the personal goals that, are, that um, determine behavior in younger and older adults. So more of an action theoretic perspective. And Carstensen has um, really uh, become very widely cited and, and quite influential in the field, um, thanks in large part to the development of socio-emotional selectivity theory, uh, according to which the salience or perceived importance of social motives is a function of perceived time left in life. So this is a kind of an interesting perspective. It's not so much your age. It's not the uh, time that you've already spent on this planet, but rather it's the time that you anticipate that you have left to live that determines the relative importance or salience of particular goals. And specifically, that looks something like this. Uh, you can see that information-seeking goals peak earlier uh, in adolescence and young adulthood. So these would be goals of, of getting to know other people, getting to know oneself, really expansive behaviors, novelty-seeking behaviors. Those tend to become less um, prominent in older age, uh, and they are replaced by emotion regulation goals, essentially uh, emphasizing personal well-being, the here and now, feeling good, um, emotionally satisfying or gratis uh, gratifying experiences. All right, now, uh, how do these socio-emotional and cognitive perspectives come together? What have researchers found recently uh, in laboratory studies uh, regarding the interplay of these factors? Is, is there maybe any evidence that age-related cognitive decline might be buffered somewhat uh, or modulated by positive emotions? Before we delve into that, I'd like to ask you what you see in this picture. What do you see? Horse and a cat. <laughs> a horse and a cat. That is a somewhat unusual response. Any other animals? Donkey. A donkey, a dog. 
donkey. Okay, so donkey uh, ends up being one of the uh, most uh, commonly reported uh, animals that people see here. The other way of seeing this, though, is, uh, and there may be many possible interpretations, these are ambiguous stimuli, uh, is as a seal, okay? Uh, why is this interesting? Well, this stimulus and others like it were presented in the context of a study where uh, it's, a bit, it's a little bit contrived, but uh, uh, you know, it's social psychological research. So here, participants would see these pictures, and they would either be uh, seeing them in a context where farm animals, for some reason, scored them points, or in a game where sea animals would score them points. So a motivation was induced to see either one or the other. And not surprisingly, perhaps, uh, participants in these two experimental conditions differed with respect to their interpretations of this picture. Uh, so this is that notion of motivated perception. Uh, and we were interested in, in looking at that aspect in younger and older adults, but of course not using stimuli like the, the donkey seal stimulus, because that is just very hairy for many reasons. Um, uh, there could be age-related differences in the preferences for seals versus donkeys and so forth. So we didn't, we didn't want to get into any of that, and we decided instead, well, we want to study motivated perception. So let's focus on a very simple perceptual quality in the color. And we asked our participants to make very boring judgments um, about colors. So is this color field mostly pink, or is it mostly yellow? And I'd like to sample some responses here. Who thinks it's mostly yellow? Who thinks it's mostly pink? They seem to have a majority for mostly pink. What about this next one? Oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely mostly pink. What about this one? Pink. Pink? pink. Well, there seems to be a bit of a pink bias uh, in this room. <laughs> but in fact, the first picture had uh, more yellow pixels than pink pixels. The second one, more pink. And then the third one was a bit, uh, bit of a tricky one because it actually has equal numbers of yellow and pink pixels. All right, so that was the task. There was variation in the percentages of pixels in the two colors. Um, and when uh, when you do this over you know, an hour, it, you, you become quite good at this and very fast, and you also become very bored. Um, <laughs> but eventually, you can respond quickly when, when there is a, a true answer, um, and you can do this with high accuracy. Of course, when it's 50-50, there is no right answer, and uh, this slows people down, and they tend to guess with 50-50 accuracy. Um, all right, so wh where is the motivational aspect in this? Because so far, it's just straightforward uh, color perception. Well, we would tell them, by the way, you earn one point for every mostly pink stimulus, or every mostly yellow or blue stimulus. The, the specific colors were, uh, were varied. So now, suddenly, pink becomes a desirable outcome. Um, of course, the, the, point, the, the point was a, awarded regardless of whether the participant said pink or yellow. It was just for every mostly pink stimulus, you get a point. Nevertheless, um, the decisions in the color decision task were affected by this, um, by this little piece of information, let's say. Now, responses to the mostly yellow stimuli were slower and were also less accurate, whereas responses to the mostly pink stimuli were faster and more accurate. And uh, for the uh, undecided stimuli, well, uh, now actually people are still slow to make those decisions, but now there's a guessing bias in favor of pink. Now taking into account this guessing bias that isn't really perceptual, it's more of a strategy thing, taking that out of it, we were interested in is the actual perception of pinkness improved because of its new emotional significance. And so we had a kind of tricky and sophisticated way, uh, model based of estimating perceptual efficiency in this task, and I'm not going to go into the mechanics of that model. I'll just present you with the results. So basically in this figure, uh, the um, what the bars indicate is perceptual efficiency. And when the values are negative, that means you're very good at extracting information from neutral stimuli. Those are the ones that consisted mostly of the neutral color, the one that you didn't really care about. Um, 
And then the valence stimuli, those are the ones that have emotional valence that either uh, lead you to gain a point or to lose a point. We also had a loss condition. And as you can see, younger adults and older adults were not significantly different. They were nearly the same when it came to perceiving the valent, the emotionally significant stimuli. But with respect to the um, neutral stimuli, those where uh, that were, you know, mostly, I guess, to stick with our example, mostly yellow. Um, their younger adults had an advantage. So for the younger adults, we see that they're more efficient there at extracting the yellowness uh, and making the correct call. They're faster and more accurate than um, older adults. And this was the case for both gains, um, so when, when it was about gaining points, as well as when it was about losing points. So it didn't really matter what direction this went in. It would matter there was that the stimuli consists mostly of um, emotionally significant information or not. That is what really determined the age difference. So the story then, at least uh, our interpretation of these data, is that despite overall loss in perceptual efficiency as reflected in slowing and, and reduced accuracy, Older adults may be as efficient as younger adults at extracting emotionally significant information from ambiguous stimuli. So it's almost as if there's a sparing. And when the information when it really matters, when the information really matters to you, uh, then uh, well, there is an age here. difference <laughs> in, in perception. <coughs> and this actually goes along nicely with some findings in neuroscience that show that there's top-down modulation, top-down meaning uh, goal-directed modulation of processing even in early visual uh, processing areas in the brain. So goals and, and kind of task settings matter and do affect even the most basic uh, cognitive perceptual processes. Is this also true for uh, attention, which we tend to think of as something slightly more, uh, again, complex uh, or something that builds upon perception? Uh, one way to measure people's attention and a very <coughs> sensitive measure of what people are selectively uh, attending is uh, eye tracking. Um, so I have, I've never done any eye tracking research myself, uh, but this is the basic idea. Uh, the participant wears a device that is mounted on the head and, and their eye movements can be tracked. Uh, and so you can see, for example, when you present a positive, and a neutral, sorry, in this case a negative and a neutral stimulus, their faces here, side by side, you can see the participants' eye movements you know, going back and forth between these two faces, and you can measure the number of gaze fixations and the duration and so forth. And that uh, is thought to give a measure of their attentional uh, preferences. And Isaacowitz et al. Um, did a study published in the Journal of Motion in 2006 where they used uh, synthetic faces, such as the ones up there. I don't know how well these show up on the slide. Um, again, the uh, rationale for using synthetic faces is uh, similar to the rationale that we had for using color stimuli. Uh, it's just sort of a, you know, let's keep it very basic, get rid of any extraneous features that might be distracting. Let's really distill this down to uh, the essence of what we're interested in namely emotional expression. So you can see that the face on the left there is the neutral one, sort of the prototype, and then on, in the top row we have increases in positivity, and in the bottom row we have increasing negativity, so it looks sadder and sadder as you move towards the right. So the neutral and then a, a positive or negative face would be presented side by side, and eye movements were tracked. And uh, in this graph, uh, focus only on the left two clusters of bars. Uh, the other two uh, clusters really represent uh, another measure, not an eye tracking measure. So what is shown here are bias scores, where essentially positive values indicate a preference, an intentional preference to look at the, um, the positive, uh, the emotional face, and negative values indicate uh, a tendency to look away from the emotional face. And as you can see, for the sad faces, both younger and older adults show uh, a tendency to not look at the sad faces. They'd rather look at a neutral face than at a sad face. Uh, but there's no significant age difference there. But if we look at the second cluster, you can see that there's this very high bar. This is a very pronounced bias on the part of older adults. 
to focus on the happy face rather than the neutral face. Mm -hmm. So again, eye movements giving us kind of a direct window into attentional processing and preferences uh, in younger and older adults. When we use other measures, behavior, behavioral reaction time measures, um, the, that's what's represented in the other in the rest of this figure. The differences are are there, but they don't come out as, as nice, as, not as pronounced. So, uh, what these data suggest is that age differences in at least some measures of selective attention are consistent with an age-related positivity bias, a focus towards happy faces away from sad or even neutral faces in the attentional domain. So now we've talked about perception um, and attention. <coughs> Let's talk about memory. This mm -hmm. tends to be a domain that people care about uh, very much uh, in terms of uh, age-related declines or ways to, to halt, slow down that, that age-related decline. Um, Charles et al. published a study, by now a classic study, in 2003, uh, where they showed their younger and older participants uh, pictures that depicted either happy scenes or neutral scenes or uh, negative scenes. So happy, negative is a cemetery scene, and then here we have some sort of a nondescript grocery store scene that would be neutral. And then they probed their recall for these pictures uh, sometime later. And so these are number of images recalled as a function of age group and as a function of the emotional valence of the stimuli. As you can see, uh, for younger adults, emotional materials are better remembered than neutral materials. Those, uh, there's an advantage for emotional pictures. Uh, in middle age, we begin to see a differentiation where um, uh, what I said about younger adults still holds true, but now the positive pictures are beginning to show a slight advantage in memory. And for the older adults, that is really very uh, you know, clear and plain to see. Uh, positive images here are more easily recalled than negative or neutral images. In fact, the negative images have lost their memorial advantage altogether. They have become just as um, kind of uh, non-memorable as neutral images. So again, there's this positivity bias. It should be said, though, that it has not been found consistently across studies. It's only in, uh, in um, a subset of studies that have shown the pattern this nicely. And that was part of the reason that heterogeneity in the literature was part of the reason why uh, we were interested in doing a follow-up study, uh, very similar, but using a, um, a different type of memory task. So during the study phase, uh, individuals here were presented with positive and negative and neutral stimuli, words, faces, and pictures, and their task was to not only look at them, but, but actually rate their emotional significance. So say whether this is a negative word or a neutral word or a positive word. So they were asked to engage with these materials in a meaningful way. And then during the memory test, they were presented with some of the study pictures as well as with some new pictures that they had never seen before and words and faces. Um, and the task was to say old or new. So I studied this or I did not study this. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we found was uh, an interesting pattern whereby, again, I can't really go too much into the mechanics of, of deriving the measure that, that I'm showing here. But we found this pattern of where um, Younger adults were extremely good at detecting novel, um, detecting the new pictures and faces and words, those that they hadn't studied. And so this is sort of a bias for detecting novelty that we see in the younger adults shown in pink. Um, and it is actually not really modulated by emotion in this recognition task. For the older adults shown in blue, we can see that, yes, they have a bit of the same uh, novelty bias going on uh, for negative and neutral uh, recognition. But for positive materials, it flips. And, and this is driving an interaction then of age and emotional valence. Uh, for positive items, we see that there is no novelty bias. On the contrary, there is a familiarity bias, suggesting that to the older adults in our sample, all of the positive materials that they were presented with in the recognition test they seemed faintly familiar, vaguely familiar. They were more likely to endorse them as being old, as having been studied. So it's almost as if they were sort of 
perpetually primed for the positive uh, items. So to summarize, when asked to recognize previously studied materials, the positive items elicited greater familiarity for older adults than they did for younger adults. Perhaps, and this, is, uh, this was our speculation, due to chronic activation of emotion regulation goals, positive pictures, faces, and words elicit more of a resonance and that is reflected in recognition performance. Now this is a, a, a final uh, set of uh, studies from my own lab, uh, where again, we're looking at memory, but in a slightly different way. Uh, here the question was, do we maybe learn better when we're hoping for a reward? We know that rewards do a lot of things. Uh, we know that when we're rewarded for certain behaviors, those behaviors become more likely, and when we're punished, those behaviors become less likely, or they should. Uh, is the same true for learning and memory? Does reward or the anticipation of reward somehow make learning and encoding uh, easier? The reason that we were interested in this is uh, a burgeoning a neuroscience literature on uh, the dopamine network in the brain, the so-called reward network. Um, so the reward system with um, which really has its, its nuclei in the midbrain, deep down in the brain, uh, it is anatomically and functionally connected to other brain areas that subserve cognitive function. So as you can see, uh, these red, these projections go into the basal ganglia and the prefrontal cortex. Um, so the reward centers do talk to other parts of the brain, and those other parts of the brain subserve memory, some of them. Unfortunately, we know from um, uh, this line of research with uh, a lot of it done with PET imaging that there is dopamine decline with aging. As I mentioned earlier, this is one of the neurotransmitter systems that are hit by aging. Uh, and there seems to be a reduction in the density of these recept uh, receptors, these D2 receptors in the brain, and that's shown in this PET scan very impressively. Um, However, there's also, there was also reason to think that rewards still, despite this dopaminergic decline, still works for older adults, so to speak. Uh, this is another data from another fMRI study um, published in 2007 that shows that there is preservation in older adults of reward-related activity in those reward circuits uh, in the brain. So these are brain activation measures, and as you can see, I have it, yes. Over here, when you increase um, the size of an anticipated reward, you see a concomitant increase in activity in the medial caudate, which is one of those reward regions. And you see that both in younger and older adults. Whereas actually for losses, you don't see that in both age groups. You see it for the younger adults in the black line but for older adults, there's kind of a flattening in that sensitivity to monetary losses or to anticipated losses. So again, an interesting asymmetry. Uh, preserved uh, response to rewards, non-preserved response to losses. Yes. Losses include deaths and other... Well, uh, probably uh, this extends to um, non-monetary losses mm -hmm. and gains as well, but, it, but neuroscientists like to use monetary rewards uh, or else primary rewards like uh, a squirt of juice, um, not those more complex uh, types of social rewards and, and losses because they're simply easier to manipulate and to uh, calibrate in the lab. Um, so in other words, there was some mixed evidence th that, uh, that we had considered going into the study. On the one hand, dopaminergic decline. On the other hand, some preservation also in sensitivity to rewards. So we used a paradigm previously used by fMRI researchers. We used it on dry land, so to speak, in the lab. In this paradigm, participants on day one of the study would be presented with pictures, with pictures of scenes, and each picture would be presented, um, would be preceded, excuse me, by a cue, a reward cue that would be either high, one dollar, or low, one cent. And so not very subtle at all. Uh, we would t let people know in this way that the upcoming picture would be worth either a dollar, if they were to remember it the next day, or it would be worth one cent. And then there was a bit of a distractor task here just to keep people occupied in between the picture presentations. We'll go into that. 
24 hours later, people came back to the lab, and they were now, again, given a recognition test where those old pictures were now intermixed with new pictures, and they were asked to make these old, new decisions. And lo and behold, the high-value items were better remembered than the low-value items. So the, the green bars are higher than the white bars. And this was true in both younger and older groups. And it's a fairly subtle effect. It's a small effect size. But it is significant in both age groups, um, suggesting that this manipulation of anticipated reward on day one affected something about the encoding or consolidation of these picture <coughs> memories and the successful retrieval on day two. We also replicated this, and we wanted to see if it maybe would <coughs> still happen if even if we tested folks the same day, so study tests on, this, on the same day in an immediate test rather than spaced by 24 hours. And as you can see on, see on the immediate test, we have an age difference there. That's not, that's not unusual, a small age difference in recognition performance but actually no effect of reward at all. But again, uh, as in the previous study with the delayed test, we do see the small increase for the high reward items in both age groups. And again, no change with age. So it appears that motivation, uh, or uh, in this case reward anticipation, at encoding boosts subsequent memory in both younger and older adults. Um, no evidence of any age-related decline in this effect. And the possible mechanism here may be memory consolidation. Because again, we didn't see the effect on day one. We only saw it after a while, after 24 hours had elapsed. So it suggests that there's something that has to build over time, that has to consolidate over time. Finally, I'd like to uh, say a little bit, bit about decision making, not very much because we're uh, getting close to the end of our, our session. Um, in decision making research, uh, there has, first of all, it's long been neglected uh, by cognitive aging researchers. There isn't a whole lot that we know about how decision making, decision -making ability changes with age. Um, there is, however, evidence for some stability in some of the component um, processes. For example, when you're having to deal with uncertain information, uncertainty, you have to weigh pros and cons. Sometimes probabilities are involved. And probabilistic reasoning is relatively stable, so there don't seem to be any large uh, age-related changes there. Also, risky choice, choosing between options that come with potential risks or benefits, uh, weighing probabilities and their, and their payoffs. Um, that seems to be relatively well preserved. However, some types of decision making have a memory component. Um, and in one study that uh, I did during my uh, doctoral research, I found that in a kind of simulated medical diagnosis task, um, older adults showed worse performance compared to younger adults uh, because they were overly conservative. Uh, they made very cautious um, probabilistic judgments that patient A might have a certain disease. Uh, they were not nearly as uh, extreme in their probability judgments as the younger adults were, even when this would have been appropriate. So for example, some symptom might have always been indicative of a certain disease, but older adults would have said, well, probably this, pa uh, this patient has the disease um, you know, 70% sure, when the correct answer would have been 90 or 95% sure. So overly conservative um, evaluation of probabilities, and I related this to memory, not anything about probabilistic reasoning per se, but simply um, reduced memory on the part of older adults for the information, for the um, uh, relationships between diseases and symptoms to begin with. And in fact, when I gave them additional study time to familiarize themselves with these relationships by viewing more patient files, um, then older adults were able to um, sort of overcome this excess of conservatism. So the question is, how do socio-emotional changes affect older adults' decisions? Um, this has really only recently begun to be studied. 
and again, Carson's, is, Carson's group is one of the main uh, contributors there. And in a, an interesting recent study, younger and older adults were given uh, healthcare decision scenarios. And the researchers were interested in the information seeking behavior uh, of younger and older patients. Of course, these were not real patients, but simulated patients. They were asked to pretend that they were in this in the situation of choosing from among various health plans. Uh, so they were interested in the information seeking behavior and um, whether there would be age differences in the preference for um, positive features versus negative features of particular plants. So here, uh, the participants were told, the information about the health plans is concealed in the boxes. Just click on the boxes with the computer mouse to see what's behind uh, them. Uh, you can look at each piece of information as often as you like. Please note that the fields are coded such that white fields uh, contain positive information about the health plan, um, good or very good features, gray fields contain neutral information, and dark fields contain bad news about a particular health plan. Um, what they found when they looked at uh, the sampling behavior, which boxes do people click on most often? Uh, the white, the gray, or the dark? Um, what they found in the control conditions, sort of the standard conditions, simply asking people to explore however they pleased. Um, older adults showed a bias towards the white boxes. They would rather look at the good news about each of the health plan, uh, healthcare options. And they were not particularly interested in the bad news. They rarely clicked on the dark boxes. Whereas uh, younger adults show a relative balance between the um, bad news and uh, good news information seeking. However, when an information focus was induced uh, in the participants prior to the sampling phase, basically when they were told, please just focus on the facts and the objective information here, try to really figure out which plan is best, then uh, older adults behave much like the younger adults and their preference for those white boxes for the, for the positive aspects uh, was kind of suppressed. Uh, it was as if they realized that they would need to sample from, from the entire range of, um, of available information. So again, research on decision making is still relatively scarce. Current evidence suggests that declines in executive functions and long-term memory threaten decision quality, whereas prioritization of short-term positive emotion may bias information seeking. So of course, your decisions will be uh, will be different if you don't even look at some of the available evidence before you make a, make a decision. And if your goal is to feel good in the short term, is to you know uh, not think about potential problems that may arise as a function of, for example, your financial decisions or your healthcare decisions, then you may not decide optimally. This may this may negatively impact the decision quality. Now, after this uh, kind of whirlwind review of recent studies in this domain, um, I'd like to just throw out a few thoughts about what this all might mean and uh, what we should take away from it. I think that it's critical that uh, in order to optimize that gain-loss balance that Paul Baltus, uh talked about, we need to understand the links between cognition and motivation. So really, cognitive aging as an isolated field of research, um, I think has outlived its, its usefulness, or rather it needs to be um, supplemented with an understanding of uh, motivational factors. Um, some of this evidence suggests very clearly that motivational states, socio-emotional goals and so on, bias cognition. So they, they introduce a bias towards positive, away from negative information. But perhaps more, more interesting to me anyway is this idea that in addition to simply biasing the preferences, uh, motivation may also boost cognition, may improve cognition, may improve the outcomes. Uh, and I think the reward effects that I talked about in um, uh, a few slides ago um, Granted, those were small effects, and there were effects of monetary rewards, which we 
can't realistically implement in everyday life for every little decision that we have to make or every little um, memory task that we that we're confronted with. Nevertheless, if they suggest there is plasticity, that um, there remains sensitivity to motivational incentives, and that maybe this might be an effective angle to think about cognition. Cognition tends to be relatively spared in aging when it really matters, when people really care. Um, and so I think that for those reasons, when we're thinking about memory training and cognitive training for older people, what we really need to be focusing on more, and some researchers are doing this already, is intellectual and social engagement in a meaningful, rewarding context. People have to care and they have to want. Um, and then these little trade-offs are made. And then um, select, uh, you know, uh, selectivity and optimization and compensation, uh, as the lifespan developmentalists talk about, can kick in. Uh, and I think that that kind of training or, or challenge is far more powerful, potentially, than the traditional cognitive training, where you're asked to uh, you know, perform um, particular little tasks over and over and over, and your improvement is tracked from one session to another. That's very interesting, and it tells us a lot about, um, about the limits of, of cognitive plasticity, but at the same time, realistically, I think what's more effective are uh, interventions that take advantage of the, the power of motivation, and in particular, since socio-emotional goals appear to become so important uh, as we age, Cognitive challenges and cognitive activity has to be linked to those socio-emotional contexts. Uh, and one example I found is this uh, program called Senior Odyssey, uh, community-based cognitive intervention out of uh, the University of Illinois, a uh, project that's been very promising. Uh, there are some articles, uh, research articles out there about it already that shows uh, that this type of challenge and these types of programs have more the potential for more transfer effects uh, and more lasting change training effects than the traditional classic training programs that are more sort of narrowly cognitive. <clears throat> so with that, I'd like to end my presentation. I thank you uh, all so much for your attention. And I'd also like to acknowledge my current and former collaborators, uh, as well as the members of the MAD Memory and Decision Lab at Ryerson University. If there are any questions, I would be happy to uh, take them. Uh, I'd like to compliment you on your presentation. It was really excellent. Thank you. Very clear and very interesting. <coughs> it occurred to me as you were talking about this preference for the positive and the flat negative, the flat re response to negativity yes. <coughs> and loss. But that's the way older people cope. It's a coping strategy. Uh, as you get closer to the end, you don't really want to deal with unpleasant things, and you don't want to hear about losses if you can avoid it. So it's a very strong, I think, factor in how people perceive things and how they remember them. If, if you want to call that motivation, you can. I think it's even more than motivation. Yeah, so you're, you're kind of getting at the self-preservation aspect almost of focusing away from uh, from negative thoughts and memories and experiences and focusing instead <coughs> on uh, on the positive. I've observed in many occasions, and I've been annoyed with people, that they don't express more sadness about the death of a friend or something, but i come to understand that that's their way of handling it. Yeah, a coping mechanism. Yeah. yeah. That's a, I think that's an apt description. Uh, and it's, uh, again, it's one of those adaptive um, changes that we don't just see in aging, we also see in, in populations that are faced with enormous losses, like the uh, earthquake survivors yeah, now. I guess. Um, there was just an article actually published about how earthquake survivors in Haiti, uh, there, there doesn't seem to be an outpouring of emotion, there doesn't seem to be uh, an expression of grief that we would imagine should be taking place, um, simply because people can't uh, can't go there. If they do, it's, uh, they, they'll, they can never yeah. function uh, right. again. And right now they need to concentrate on survival. On survival. So it's a similar kind of sentiment yeah. that you're expressing. Um, I just have a question if I understand how this might apply. Um, in home care, 
So working with individuals in their homes, because as I understand, sort of your last slide was related to community-based, so assuming that yes. that's just the social um, interactions that are occurring with yeah. individuals there, that there's some motivation there because of that social context. Exactly, and teams competing, actually. So yes. this is a very competitive uh, uh, program where uh, not individually competitive, but team-based yes. competition. Sure. So, so my question is, if you had to say what the implication would be for your research to the home environment with an individual in the home, how would you see it applying? How, how could it be used to assist individuals in a home environment? Yeah, so in a home environment, obviously you don't have some of these resources that you would need to, to implement um, a program such as the one that I was describing. Uh, you may not have the mobility, you may not have uh, a lot of the other uh, resources that, that would be required. So in a spirit of selective optimization and compensation, I guess the, the answer would be to focus on what is available and to, um, to let go some of these other opportunities and to accept that they may no longer be, uh, be options um, and to uh, optimize the existing resources. Um, so to work with what the person does have and um, what is available in that sort of more limited environment, um, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, uh, social interaction, then that is what needs to be maximized and what needs to be um, uh, emphasized in, in treatment. So lots of engagement, if it's not at a group level, then on a one-on-one -on -one level. Um, I think the, uh, the role of social relationships, of, of individual personal relationships, um, the, its impact on cognition has long been underestimated and is, is now sort of beginning to be really appreciated. Excellent question. Of course, uh, this was all research. You may have noticed this, and that's, that may have prompted your question. Um, research with so-called healthy, normal uh, individuals. So those who have no um, clinical histories, no history of depression, no history of uh, major uh, physical health problems. So in some ways, these are um, the studies that I've presented mostly were done on sort of the superstars of aging, but also have the younger adults. Yes. Um, and so these were not clinical samples. So I would be hesitant to generalize uh, to those kinds of groups. Um, we do know, that, though, that of course that depression, um, both in younger and older adults, has obviously a major cognitive component. And some of the things that I touched on today uh, would be relevant for a cognitive view of depression. So for example, um, this positivity bias that I've been that I've been talking about in memory, you would not expect to see that in a in a depressive person um, because um, there is an overgeneral negative uh, memory that you see and also in, in other domains, not just in memory but in um, attention and um, perception. Um, there's been some research that I'm aware of that's shown that 
in people with major depression, th those, you know, everything is flipped. So they uh, attend, they're hyper vigilant, they're looking for the bad news, so to speak. Um, they will spend more time fixating on the negative face. Um, they're quicker to detect threats. Um, and they're also um, much more likely to recall negative episodes, both from their autobiographical memory um, as well as from laboratory um, materials that they were presented with. So um, it's, it's clear that there is a, a major impact on, on emotional, motivational cognition. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much.